Um, uh, my name, as I said, is Linda Anderson. Um, I am president of Rock Island Preservation Society, and, and it's in that capacity, I'm going to have to stand closer, it's in that capacity that I am here today um, to present this information to you. Um, I, uh, I'm going to have to look at my slides, I guess. Uh, I am a homeowner in Highland Park Historic District in Rock Island, and I moved to the Quad Cities about 25 years ago. And after living um, in the cities for not a very long time, I bought my house in Highland Park. Um, I kind of make reference, as I did to my table earlier, that it's kind of like coming to religion a little late in life. Um, when I moved to the Quad Cities, I didn't really know anything about Rock Island. I didn't know anything that much about the Quad Cities. And so as I was investigating the history and, and the my neighborhood and the architecture in my neighborhood, I got involved in historic preservation here in the Quad Cities. Um, and so I'm one of those born again preservationists, I guess, <laughs> and ergo my zeal. Um, Highland Park is very close to the Hobrook Estate, and um, when I joined the Preservation Society, one of the things I started doing early on was writing a newsletter, um, which allowed me the opportunity to do a lot of interesting reading and research and, and use Rich's library as my source material for most of it. Um, but I started uh, learning more about the Hobart estate and, and ultimately uh, led to this project. I would be remiss if I didn't actually say that the project started with our own member, Jeannie, Jeannie Dasso, I call her Jeannie, Jean Dasso, um, who lived uh, on the other side of the estate from where I live and uh, actually got in the car and went to Lyle, um, Illinois, and to the Arboretum there, and was able to borrow the original yes, borrow glass the plates, glass slides. glass slides, for a lot of the pictures that you'll see here today. They let her take them, make pictures off of them, and then return them. Can you believe it? That's really great, great for some original source material. Um, so that was the impetus for actually putting together this slideshow. Um, wrapping around the curving hillside at 1324th Street, the Denkman Hauberg Estate is the home of John H. and Suzanne Denkman Hauberg, and it overlooks the city of Rock Island. Um, I do, I should say too, that I'm a novice to, as I said, to the area, and I know a lot of you know much, much more about history than I do. So feel free to correct me, or feel free to to let me know what I'm missing down the road, because I'm sure there are so many of you in the room that know much more than I do, but we're going to work our way through this. One of the things I noticed when I was researching um, and doing some reading about the Hobbrooks is that there was a lot less open material about Suzanne. We talk about John a lot. I hear people talk about John a lot, not quite as much about Suzanne. Um, so I, that will be the focus, basically, of, of um, my remarks here. Uh, Suzanne Christine. Denkman was born in 1872, the youngest daughter of Frederick C. A. Denkman and Catherine Denkman. The Denkman family owned sawmills and timberlands in Louisiana and Mississippi, and then in partnership with brother-in-law Frank Weyerhaeuser, uh, they built a lumber business of national significance, and the family obviously became quite wealthy. Suzanne grew up in a house of privilege with books and art, a chauffeur, summers at the beach. She also grew up a woman of substance. After high school, she attended Wellesley College, returning to Rock Island after only one year to care for her ailing mother. Later, she attended Radcliffe College and the National Kindergarten College in Chicago. Her next stop was New York City, where she worked in the kindergarten at St. Bartholomew Parish House, one of the earliest settlement houses in the country. When she returned to Rock Island, she took an active role in the community, helping to establish and manage both the local YWCA and West End Settlement. This is West End Settlement. The building still stands in the West End of Rock Island. Um, it is uh, built not very far from where uh, the Denkman's family home was at the time. In an era before social work was considered a legitimate government function, settlement houses provided many of the services to the poorest of residents. Um, the Weston Settlement Building is a, a local landmark in Rock Island, and uh, a friend of mine wrote the actual landmark nomination, and some interesting information about the Settlement House, and I'd like to share just some of that with you this afternoon. 
Um, the West End of Rock Island served as a port of entry for many working and job-seeking poor. New immigrants, single men hoping to make enough money in local industry to support a family, and married men waiting to bring their wives and their families um, lived in this area. There were mansions on 2nd Avenue, but the area south of that neighborhood was mostly poor people living in small houses. The streets were unpaved, there were no sidewalks, and saloons were everywhere. The following description of the work done at the West End Settlement is taken from a February 24, 1912 um, edition of the Rock Island Arbus. Membership in the settlement is not limited to any one class of people, but all are made welcome. That is, it is a Christian institution. It is non-sectarian, and everyone except Negroes may become members. There is no fee for membership except, a speci a speci except in special classes in only, are the only requirement. You must attend Sunday school at least once a week. Wednesday night prayer meetings um, and gospel services were held at least three times a week. And people's attendance was monitored. They were in the speech sure people were there. Although neighbors were not specific, were, were specifically excluded, Jews too were by default excluded because of the strict requirement for Christian worship. Um, there were Jewish and immigrant population, um, and there was a synagogue nearby, but those particular residents were not welcome at the settlement. A girls' sewing class with an average attendance of 50 girls between 6 and 14 met on Saturday afternoons at a fee of one penny per week. The teacher cut the fabric, but it was stitched by hand by the girls who were allowed to keep the fruits of their labor. Among the skills they learned were mending, darning, hemming, and embroidery. Mothers also learned sewing at a penny a week. They met on Thursday afternoon with an average attendance of 18 to 29. They could bring their babies under six years of age who were cared for while the mothers stitched. A good, substantial, warm lunch was served. The settlement provided all sewing materials and fabric, but also kept the finished product. These were given to needy people or sold at very low, co low cost. A small charge was made so that recipients would not feel as if they were receiving charity. There was a morning kindergarten class five days a week at a charge of one penny a day, and it included a lunch of milk, oatmeal crackers, and bread. Mothers could use the service as a babysitter while they worked a half day. At a day nursery for babies, mothers were taught proper child care. Babies could get free milk and nursing care, and crippled children were provided therapy and braces. Bathing privileges were also an option for members, and two showers and two bathtubs were available for public use. Those younger than 17 were charged two cents, while those older paid three. Non-members could also bathe by paying five cents. The fee included warm water, soap, bowls, brushes, etc. Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays were the days allotted for men, while women had only Tuesdays and Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture of Suzanne at the settlement with some of the kids. <coughs> The year was 1908, and Suzanne needed a home of her own. She had not yet met John Hauberg, and she had no plans to marry. So just as she tackled the other important projects in her life, she set about the process of building a home. She hired prairie school architect Robert C. Spencer, Jr., a contemporary of Frank Lloyd Wright. He designed a palatial brick mansion where medieval half-timbering was incorporated into a geometric rectilinear structure. Possibly the largest home ever designed by Spencer, it marks an important milestone in the outward spread of early modern architecture from its Midwest Center in Chicago. The house consisted of an owner's wing and a servant's wing. The basement contained a huge laundry and water softening system. The house was equipped with an interior fire hose system, complete with a holding tank for water on the third floor. Main floor rooms included the living room, dining room, library, office, two sun porches. There were four major bedrooms on the second floor. The servant's wing included the kitchen, a very large butler pantry, and sleeping quarters for the, for the servants. The other major building on the property was the garage and room for, with room for six cars and stables for four horses and an expansive greenhouse. Across what is now 24th Street, 
there was a tool house that stood sentry over vast vegetable and flower gardens. But what the house is best known for is its abundance of tulips. Tulips in various sizes and shapes from a few inches to several feet appear in leaded window inserts, carved paneling, urns, organ screens, lights, fireplace mantles, and sculptured ceilings. When it was finished in 1911, just in time for Miss Denkman's marriage to John Hover, Hover they even had rugs and much of the furniture featured the tulip design. I was going to say, when I first started doing all this research, everybody talked about how tulips must have been Suzanne's favorite flower. Why else would there be tulips all over this house? <coughs> well, just a couple years ago, um, I was doing some surfing around on the internet, and there is a house in Chicago designed by the same architect, and lo and behold, it is full of tulips. So I think the architect may have had something to do with oh, right here. Oh, Spencer? Okay. Um, yeah. He seemed like he had either a penchant for a certain type of flower or a certain type of leaf, something of that sort when, in his architecture. So I, and if you, when we get going through the gardens more, there was nary a tulip on the grounds of Suzanne Hauberg's house. I'm not so sure about that. <clears throat> so we'll try this again. In 1914, uh, beautiful pictures of the home, its furnishings, the carriage houses, the greenhouse and gardens were featured in the magazine The Western Architect. Um, and that's where this picture comes from. They're really quite dark. The only pictures that I had available were actually burned onto a CD and they were this dark on that CD. But a copy of the actual article and its pictures um, is on display at Hoburg and it's, you can see it there outside the library there at the mansion. Okay, but what we're actually here to talk about today is the landscape. And at the time the construction of the house began, the hillside that overlooked um, Rock Island, this was the hillside, this was the large meadow. Um, so to enhance the prairie school of the house, Miss Denkman retained landscape architect Jens Jensen to design the landscape for her estate. Jens Jensen was born in Denmark in 1860 and immigrated to America in 1884. He worked as a day laborer in Florida for a short time and then moved to Decorah, Iowa, where he is credited with developing the campus plan for Luther College. While in Iowa, he fell in love with the Midwest landscape, a landscape that would influence his work for the rest of his life. A job as a gardener for West Chicago Park District took Jens Jensen to Chicago. He was soon promoted to foreman, and when a garden area planted in exotic flowers, as was common at the time, withered and died, Jensen traveled to the surrounding prairie and gathered native wildflowers. He transplanted these wildflowers into a garden space in Union Park, establishing what became known as the American Garden. By 1905, Jensen was the general superintendent and chief landscape architect for the West Park system in Chicago. His design work for the city can be seen in Humboldt Park, Lincoln Park, Douglas Park, and Columbus Park. One of the earliest environmentalist activists, Jens Jensen founded the Friends of Our Native Landscape, an organization that was instrumental in preserving important natural areas throughout the Midwest. He was a driving force in establishing the Cook County Forest Preserve District, the Illinois State Park System, and the Indiana Dunes State Park and National Lakeshore. In 1920, Jensen left the Park District to establish his own design firm in Ravinia, Illinois, where he worked on both public and private design projects. His client list was impressive and included Henry and Edsel Ford, Frederick Pabst, the Armour and Florsheim families. He also designed parks in Racine and Madison, Wisconsin, Dubuque, Iowa, and Springfield, Illinois. In 1935, at the age of 75, he retired from his Chicago business and founded The Clearing on 128 wooded acres in Wisconsin's Door County Peninsula. The Clearing still operates each summer today as an adult school of discovery in arts, nature, and the humanities.
Jens Jensen is known as the father of prairie style landscape design in the same way that Frank Lloyd Wright holds this title in the world of architecture. Jensen was fascinated by the vast prairie landscape, its changing colors and swaying movements. He took hundreds of photos from broad sweeping landscapes to a wildflower's smallest detail. He used the sky, the wind, the movement of water, and even the seasons along with native plants to develop landscapes that were beautiful, understandable, and ongoing. He understood that landscapes, unlike other forms of art, will mature, even die and regenerate. It has been suggested that his understanding of the natural progression of a design landscape was his greatest strength. Jens Jensen believed that our surroundings affect the way we think and live. He identified unique landscape characteristics in all parts of the country, and he believed that understanding one's own regional ecology was fundamental to all clear thinking. He valued the sunrise, the sunsets, and often incorporated a clearing into his landscape just for the purpose of viewing these daily occurrences. Included in many of his designs was the council ring, a low circular wall or grouping of stones evoking both his native Viking past and Native American egalitarianism. A group sitting on these stones would be gathered in a continuous circle. There would be no head of the table, no hierarchy, just a simple affirmation that each member of the community was important to all. In the same way, each element of a landscape design has its own important role to play. Jens Jensen died at his home, The Clearing, on October 1, 1951, at the age of 91. The landscape plan that he designed for the Denkman Hauberg estate is divided into three sections, a terrace garden, an open meadow, and a woodland forest. Um, this particular uh, drawing does come from the Western Architect as well, and it's obviously quite small in here, so I apologize for that, but it does give us an idea of where we're going to go as we travel around the landscape. Um, we have some booklets up here, um, if you care to see one at the end, that you're welcome to have. But they have these drawings um, in the booklet, so it's a little easier to see them that way. So today, let's take a virtual tour of the landscape. We will see in pictures the gardens as they were created. We will look for hints of original design features in the gardens as they exist today. And we will allow ourselves to envision the gardens restored to a portion of their original glory. The terrace. We'll begin our tour, tour at the north end of the house. A wall terrace provides an expansive view of the gardens and to the north and to the west. This curved pergola covered a brick walk around a planting bed, and large decorative cast concrete urns mark the entrances. If I back up a little bit, you can see this is, um, you know, where we're where we're looking at the house. So this gives you an idea, and this right here is the pergola. That is where we're starting our tour. This is a picture of the terrace today. The pergola is gone, <coughs> but the concrete uh, planters remain. The hand labor that went into sculpting the terrace gardens for this for the gardens were amazing. Um, the caption written next to this picture, possibly in the hand of Suzanne herself, says, Shoveling Phil along Terrace Gardens, 1909. Men working with teams of horses cleared the land, formed four long terraces. Four sets of concrete steps were built at the north and the south of these long terraces. Finishing up the terrace, and this is looking north from the house. A concrete retaining wall was built at the base of the hill, and this picture is cap captioned, Concrete Machine, January 2010. Can you really pour concrete in January in the Midwest? Yeah, I was a salamander. <laughs> I mean, it kept it when, it was, when they were mixing it, but I don't, when it hit the ground, I would think it would have hardened up pretty quickly. Yeah, the horses had a blanket. <laughs> This is another picture showing the building of the wall. 
So the house is sitting at the top of the hill. This wall is down at the bottom of the hill. Um, and so all those terrace gardens are in the inner, in the middle. <coughs> These are the finished terrace gardens. So when we're here, you can see that they're trying to build these terraces in this area along here. <coughs> and this is when they're done. The arbor in the room, at the area at the back, um, runs along the top of the terraces. That was before they grew their grapes. This is a copy of the original Jens Jensen planting plan for the terrace gardens, it's signed and dated in 1910. And the original of this artifact is framed and hangs on the wall in the sun porch at the Harvard Mansion. Jen Jensen's plan recommended trees such as crabapple, plum, hawthorn, and witch hazel be planted above the north half of the cement wall, supporting the tiered gardens. Low-growing bushes and sand cherries and wild gooseberries, wild currant, would have been planted near the south steps. Grassy slopes between the four tiers of plantings would provide protection against soil erosion and create a colorful picture frame effect to display the peaches, cherries, and plums growing on each side of white gravel paths that run the length of the terrace. So this is just half of that planting plan. This shows the south half and shows Jens Jensen's signature. This would be the north half. All across the top here is where the grape arbor is. Here's a small little terraced building where they used to stomp the grapes, I guess, so they say. <laughs> the south end of the, stair <coughs> of the top terrace started with the slattice entrance. And here you can see, you can walk down this lattice covered terrace. And here are the gardens after they've been planted. Middle pair of terraces were planted with strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, and asparagus beds. Bittersweet vines meandered along the top of the cement wall near the base of the hill. It's a great place for the family to go out and walk. And look back at the house. Looks like the even had the ability to have water running out there when they wanted it. This um, slide is to give you an idea of how large those terrace gardens were. Um, so this is the house here. Down here are blocks of the city of Rock Island. So the terraces ran all the way from their house at the top of the hill, all along the crest of the hill, um, a good one and a half, two city blocks. Here we're bound again at the bottom of the hill, and uh, this is to kind of give you an idea of where things were uh, placed. Their uh, arbor is up the top, where it says arbor. Concrete wall is down here. And in this area, this is all where those long terraces were running, and the steps that come down on either side. They had a small sitting house, a lattice house, and a lot of people today still talk about remembering the lattice house when they would go up there and play in the gardens. I'm not sure who is in this picture, but um, years ago uh, when I first came to Rock Island, I worked in retail pharmacy in those days. I uh, worked um, on 18th Avenue in Rock Island, and Ada Mary Burke uh, came to the pharmacy there, and she was aware of my looking into the, the uh, history of the gardens. And she gave me photocopies of a bunch of pictures that she had taken or her family had taken when she was a little girl from a little camera. Um, and this is one of those pictures, so I'm not sure if that's Ada Mary or not. Here we um, see the steps as they exist today. Um, we took this actually in the winter because you can really see them better in the, in the snow. Um, when there's a lot of vegetation growing, it's a, it's a little bit harder to see them. But there are... Four tiers. Four tiers All the way up. Red cement. And they're red cement. Yeah. <laughs> the central section of the landscape is an open meadow. 
Jensen's designs often included a large meadow surrounded or edged by forest. Grand open areas provided space for large gatherings, a place to enjoy the warmth of sunlight, a place for an un unobstructed view of the stars and the night sky. The early site plan appear, appears to show a walk or stairs along the south side of the meadow, even a gate towards the bottom of the plan. And indeed, there are remnants of a line of brick that runs along the south side of the meadow. Jeannie and I have wandered down there and found it, so it's there. Yes, it's there. <laughs> Might this at one time have actually been a path going to the north? This is the open meadow today. Um, the ground is covered with blue wildflowers in the spring. And at the, um, this is the home to the, was the home to five live deer the day that I took this picture. Um, the deer could have cared less about me. There was a dog barking when I got out of the car. The deer were fine. They were very happy there. <laughs> During the winter, the, the hill would have been blanketed with snow. And this is a picture of John Hauberg Jr. sledding with a bunch of neighborhood kids on that hill. A current picture taken from the top side of the meadow reminds us of Jensen's, Jensen's intent to have us, have us experience the movement of the leaves of the trees, the dancing of the sunlight at midday, and the changing of the colors all around us as night falls. The third section of the landscape was a woodland forest. Making its way back towards the house, we would come upon a driving path heading off to the right and into the woodland forest. So if we're standing at the front porch of the house and we look off to the left, there's a little roadway that starts heading down the hill, and that's where we're gonna go now. When the Dankman Hauberg House was built, this drive path was the entrance to the estate. Everyone came to visit from the south, came up this long winding path. Actually, there was no real street at 24th Street. There was a lane there, and that was where they got their deliveries. But that was really not considered a street. It was out in the country, and uh, people would come from the, would have entered the house from the south. Starting with nothing that looked like a woodland, Jensen and his workers planted a wide variety of trees, including white birch, oak, yellow poplar, wild cherry, linden, and the Canadian hemlock. And it appears that they transplanted some pretty large trees in pretty cold weather. <laughs> Midway down the hillside, a Jensen-designed concrete bridge appears. The bridge was constructed over a ravine that had been sculpted into the hill like right there at the mansion. But what we're actually here to talk about today is the landscape. And at the time the construction of the house began, the hillside that overlooked um, Rock Island, this was the hillside. This was the large meadow. Um, the house? So to enhance the prairie school of the house, Miss Dankman retained landscape architect Jens Jensen to design the landscape for her estate. Jens Jensen was born in Denmark in 1860 and immigrated to America in 1884. He worked as a day laborer in Florida for a short time and then moved to Decorah, Iowa, where he is credited with developing the campus plan for Luther College. While in Iowa, he fell in love with the Midwest landscape, a landscape that would influence his work for the rest of his life. A job as a gardener for West Chicago Park District took Jens Jensen to Chicago. He was soon promoted to foreman, and when a garden area planted in exotic flowers, as was common at the time, withered and died, Jensen traveled to the surrounding prairie and gathered native wildflowers. He transplanted these wildflowers into a garden space in Union Park, establishing what became known as the American Garden. By 1905, Jensen was the general superintendent and chief landscape architect for the West Park system in Chicago. His design work for the city can be seen in Humboldt Park, Lincoln Park, Douglas Park, and Columbus Park. One of the earliest environmentalist activists, Jens Jensen founded the Friends of Our Native Landscape, an organization that was instrumental in preserving important natural areas throughout the Midwest. 
He was a driving force in establishing the Cook County Forest Preserve District, the Illinois State Park System, and the Indiana Dunes State Park and National Lakeshore. In 1920, Jensen left the Park District to establish his own design firm in Ravinia, Illinois, where he worked on both public and private design projects. His client list was impressive and included Henry and Edsel Ford, Frederick Pabst, the Armour and Florsheim families. He also designed parks in Racine and Madison, Wisconsin, Dubuque, Iowa, and Springfield, Illinois. In 1935, at the age of 75, he retired from his Chicago business and founded The Clearing on 128 wooded acres in Wisconsin's Door County Peninsula. The Clearing still operates each summer today as an adult school of discovery in arts, nature, and the humanities. Jensen is known as the father of prairie style landscape design in the same way that Frank Lloyd Wright holds this title in the world of architecture. Jensen was fascinated by the vast prairie landscape, its changing colors and swaying movements. He took hundreds of photos from broad sweeping landscapes to a wildflower's smallest detail. He used the sky, the wind, the movement of water, and even the seasons along with native plants to develop landscapes that were beautiful, understandable, and ongoing. He understood that landscapes, unlike other forms of art, will mature, even die and regenerate. It has been suggested that his understanding of the natural progression of a design landscape was his greatest strength. Jens Jensen believed that our surroundings affect the way we think and live. He identified unique landscape characteristics in all parts of the country, and he believed that understanding one's own regional ecology was fundamental to all clear thinking. He valued the sunrise, the sunsets, and often incorporated a clearing into his landscape just for the purpose of viewing these daily occurrences. Included in many of his designs was the council ring, a low circular wall or grouping of stones evoking both his native Viking past and Native American egalitarianism. A group sitting on these stones would be gathered in a continuous circle. There would be no head of the table, no hierarchy, just a simple affirmation that each member of the community was important to all. In the same way, each element of a landscape design has its own important role to play. Jens Jensen died at his home, The Clearing, on October 1, 1951, at the age of 91. The landscape plan that he designed for the Denkman Hauberg estate is divided into three sections, a terrace garden, an open meadow, and a woodland forest. Um, this particular uh, drawing does come from the Western Architect as well, and it's obviously quite small in here, so I apologize for that. But it does give us an idea of where we're going to go as we travel around the landscape. Um, we have some booklets up here, um, if you care to see one at the end, that you're welcome to have. But they have these drawings um, in the booklet, so it's a little easier to see them that way. So today, let's take a virtual tour of the landscape. We will see in pictures the gardens as they were created. We will look for hints of original design features in the gardens as they exist today. And we will allow ourselves to envision the gardens restored to a portion of their original glory. The terrace. We will begin our tour at the north end of the house. A wall terrace provides an expansive view of the gardens and to the north and to the west. This curved pergola covered a brick walk around a planting bed and large decorative cast concrete urns mark the entrances. If I back up a little bit, you can see this is um, you know, where, we're, where we're looking at the house. So this gives you an idea, and this right here is the pergola. That is where we're starting our tour. This is a picture of the terrace today. The pergola is gone, but the concrete uh, planters remain. The hand labor that went into sculpting the terrace gardens for, this, for the gardens were amazing. Um, the caption written next to this picture, possibly in the hand of Suzanne herself, says, shoveling fill along terrace gardens 
1909. Men working with teams of horses cleared the land, formed four long terraces. Four sets of concrete steps were built at the north and the south of these long terraces. Finishing up the terrace, and this is looking north from the house. A concrete retaining wall was built at the base of the hill, and this picture is kept, captioned, Concrete Machine, January 2010. Can you really pour concrete in January in the Midwest? Yeah, I was salamander. <laughs> I mean, it kept it when it was when they were mixing it, but I don't, when it hit the ground, I would think it would have hardened up pretty quickly. Yeah, the horses had a blanket. <laughs> this is another picture showing the building of the wall. So the house is sitting at the top of the hill. This wall is down at the bottom of the hill, um, and so all those terrace gardens are in the inner, in the middle. <coughs> These are the finished terrace gardens. So when we're here, you can see that they're trying to build these terraces in this area along here. <coughs> and this is when they're done. The arbor in the room, at the area at the back, um, runs along the top of the terraces. That was before they grew their grapes. This is a copy of the original Jens Jensen planting plan for the terrace gardens, it's signed and dated in 1910. And the original of this artifact is framed and hangs on the wall in the sun porch at the Harvard Mansion. Jen Jensen's plan recommended trees such as crabapple, plum, hawthorn, and witch hazel be planted above the north half of the cement wall, supporting the tiered gardens. Low-growing bushes and sand cherries and wild gooseberries, wild currant, would have been planted near the south steps. Grassy slopes between the four tiers of plantings would provide protection against soil erosion and create a colorful picture frame effect to display the peaches, cherries, and plums growing on each side of white gravel paths that run the length of the terrace. So this is just half of that planting plan. This shows the south half and shows Jens Jensen's signature. This would be the north half. All across the top here is where the grape arbor is. Here's a small little terraced building where they used to stomp the grapes, I guess, so they say. <laughs> the south end of the, stair <coughs> of the top terrace started with the slightest entrance. And here you can see you can walk down this lattice covered terrace. And here are the gardens after they've been planted. Middle terraces were planted with strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, and asparagus beds. Bittersweet vines meandered along the top of the cement wall near the base of the hill. It's a great place for the family to go out and walk <laughs> and look back at the house. Looks like they even had the ability to have water running out there when they wanted it. This um, slide is to give you an idea of how large those terrace gardens were. Um, so this is the house here. Down here are blocks of the city of Rock Island. So the terraces ran all the way from their house at the top of the hill, all along the crest of the hill, um, a good one and a half, two city blocks. Here we're bound again at the bottom of the hill, and uh, this is to kind of give you an idea of where things were uh, placed. Their uh, arbor is up at the top where it says arbor, concrete wall is down here. And in this area, this is all where those long terraces were running and the steps that come down on either side. They had a small sitting house, a lattice house, and a lot of people today still talk about remembering the lattice house when they would go up there and play in the gardens. 
I'm not sure who is in this picture, but um, years ago when I first came to Rock Island, I worked in retail pharmacy in those days. I uh, worked um, on 18th Avenue in Rock Island. And Ada Mary Burke uh, came to the pharmacy there, and she was aware of my looking into the, the uh, history of the gardens. And she gave me photocopies of a bunch of pictures that she had taken or her family had taken when she was a little girl from a little camera. Um, and this is one of those pictures, so I'm not sure if that's Ada Mary or not. Here we um, see the steps as they exist today. Um, we took this actually in the winter because you can really see them better in the, in the snow um, when there's a lot of vegetation growing. It's a, it's a little bit harder to see them. But there are four tiers all the way up. Red cement. And they're red cement. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. The central section of the landscape is an open meadow. Jensen's designs often included a large meadow surrounded or etched by forest. Grand open areas provided space for large gatherings, a place to enjoy the warmth of sunlight, a place for an un unobstructed view of the stars and the night sky. The early site plan appear appears to show a walk or stairs along the south side of the meadow, even a gate towards the bottom of the plan. And indeed, there are remnants of a line of brick that runs along the south side of the meadow. Jeannie and I have wandered down there and found it, so it's there. Yes, it's there. <laughs> Might this at one time have actually been a path going to the north? This is the open meadow today. Um, the ground is covered with blue wildflowers in the spring. And at the, um, this is the home to the, was the home to five live deer the day that I took this picture. Um, the deer could have cared less about me. There was a dog barking when I got out of the car. The deer were fine. They were very happy there. <laughs> During the winter, the, the hill would have been blanketed with snow. And this is a picture of John Hobart Jr. sledding with a bunch of neighborhood kids on that hill. A current picture taken from the top side of the meadow reminds us of Jensen's, Jensen's intent to have us, experience, have us experience the movement of the leaves of the trees, the dancing of the sunlight at midday, and the changing of the colors all around us as night falls. The third section of the landscape was a woodland forest. Making its way back towards the house, we would come upon a driving path heading off to the right and into the woodland forest. So if we're standing at the front porch of the house and we look off to the left, there's a little roadway that starts heading down the hill, and that's where we're going to go now. When the Dankman Hauberk House was built, this drive path was the entrance to the estate. Everyone came to visit from the south, came up this long winding path. Actually, there was no real street at 24th Street. There was a lane there, and that was where they got their deliveries, but that was really not considered a street. It was out in the country, and uh, people would come from that, would have entered the house from the south. Starting with nothing that looked like a woodland, Jensen and his workers planted a wide variety of trees, including white birch, oak, yellow poplar, wild cherry, linden, and the Canadian hemlock. It appears that they transplanted some pretty large trees in pretty cold weather. Midway down the hillside, a Jensen-designed concrete bridge appears. The bridge was constructed over a ravine that had been sculpted into the hillside to create a stream, waterfalls, and a series of three ponds, the largest of which was near the base of the hill. So that would have been the largest pond, and it would have been at the base of the hill near the existing neighborhood. The stream was stocked with trout. And there's John Halberg fishing in his own little stream. <laughs> the pond was home to frogs and water lilies. At the bottom of the hillside, the drive ends in what would have been the main entrance to the estate. Two pillars, one now missing, marked the in with initial H rather than a D, flanked the entrance, welcoming visitors and their carriages and early motor vehicles. 
This early photo is captioned Home from Tama and shows John Halberg returning home from a camping trip with a group of young men. Um, this is just a close-up of the same photo. But notice that in this picture there is a gutter system visible along the sides of the drive. Um, not long after the pillars were installed, the drive was actually covered with brick. But here it was just gravel at the time. Then in the 1970s, the drive was covered with asphalt. There are still a few remnants of the gutter system remaining that can be seen today by a careful observer. And there are a few spots of pink colored brick that peek through the asphalt as it's being, as it's worn. Heading back up the drive, back up towards the house, the impressive nature of the long formal entrance is apparent. About halfway up the drive, just past the bridge, there are remnants of stone steps that headed up to the back of the house. Imagine taking those stone steps up to the house. <laughs> They're clearly visible in this vintage photograph. Um, over the years, there had been some work done, I believe, by uh, Boy Scouts to put some kind of wooden timber steps back in this area to get people up and down. Um, but it's virtually all overgrown now. In this same area, to the left, stands an original light pole with a finish that resembles the bark of a tree. It is easy to miss if you're walking up and down the pathway, as it appears to um, have been made out of logs. Look closely, however, and you will see it is actually made of metal, and there's a small ring at the end of the arm that would have held the light. Was this the only light pole along the drive? I'm not really sure. Was it placed here because this is where the steps were? Or is it actually the only one of many that still remains? As we continue up the driving path, we notice how the woodland has matured over time and now is a mix of older and younger specimens. We see the play of light and shadow, we hear the rustling of the leaves, the sounds of insects and songs of birds, all hallmarks of a Jen Jensen landscape. Well, I'm quite sure that Jens Jensen did not his, intend his garden to change quite as much as the gardens at Hauberk have over the years. I mean, he did intend his natural landscapes to mature, as he expressed here in his own words as written in a book he wrote named, entitled Siftings. Landscaping is a composition of life that unfolds a mysterious beauty from time to time until mature age. Compare a growing tree with a monument of stone or mortar, which is definitely shaped never to change. The tree's whole structure and its promise for the tomorrows are not surpassed on this earth. In passing, the fallen giant soon develops new beauty by feeding new growth, which extends its life into the far off future. Continuing up the driving path, we approach the top of the hill, having experienced Jen Jensen's vis vision of wandering through a forest. We follow the drive around the final curve, just as Jensen had planned. And suddenly we emerge into the clearing that is full of light, life, and dramatic architecture. This picture is, would be what you'd see when you got to the top of the roadway. The house is on the right uh, where you see the urns. To the left is, this is the stables and the garage building and the large greenhouse. Here's one of the early cars um, that the Hallbergs had. Um, Suzanne is uh, noted to have had an electric car back in those days. I know nothing about electric cars in those days, but she had one. The Dankman Hallberg landscape that we have just toured virtually is a wonderful example of Jen Jensen's philosophy of landscape architecture. Here in this landscape, he combined the elements of sky, sun, clouds, wind, water, native flowers, shrubs, trees, and organic structures to create a living landscape that was beautiful, understandable, and ongoing. Uh, we are fortunate to have this historic landscape in Rock Island. With a little care, it could once again become a landscape that could have been enjoyed by all. Um, a heartfelt thanks to all, everyone who contributed to this project, especially as I mentioned, Jean, for uh, getting the pictures from the Morton Arboretum. 
And I'd also like to mention that at the Danish Immigrant Museum in Elkhorn, Iowa, um, they have on exhibit there, Jen Jensen uh, celebrating the native prairie, uh, a really nice exhibit about uh, his work and his philosophy. Um, I would be remiss not to say that uh, I'm not encouraging anyone to run over and wander through the gardens right now. <laughs> um, they are very overgrown. Um, it just takes uh, a lot of maintenance time to um, manage a garden of that size. Uh, the upper gardens around the house are, are in great shape and, and they're used for recreation and uh, as they were uh, when Hallbergs lived there. Um, the hillside is, uh, is showing its age. But uh, if we all uh, pay attention to it, if we get more questions about the landscape when you visit the house, um, they're counting all those things and they're paying attention to how important people think that landscape is. Um, it really is a, a wonderful feature to have um, here in the Quad Cities, uh, something we can be proud of. And, uh, we might say that visit. it's owned by the city and managed by the Park District. Right? That is true. It is owned by the City of Rock Island and managed by the Park District. Yep. So, so um, a little closer in the books um, and the landscape and uh, again thanks everyone for coming and uh, if you don't want to go to the other meeting tomorrow night the Preservation Society meets on the third <laughs> Tuesday of the month. Our meeting is tomorrow night and we're voting on preservation awards so watch for those announcements coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.